Say hello to everybody that's here already. Evening. Hello, Eric. Hi, Eric. Hey, Bob. Sixon. It's good. It's nice to uh, have everybody convened for the first time here, or, or close to everybody at least. All right, so it's 5.30. Um, we'll give folks a few minutes to sort of uh, pour in here. We have 12, um, 12 of us here already. Um, so there are a few people that we're still waiting on. Um, and it looks like uh, just, it looks like um, Councillor Verdick, um, I think is included as an attendee. So I'm trying to promote you as a panelist, uh, Councillor Verdick, so that you're um, able to be seen on the screen. Can, can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah, I can hear you, Larry. Uh, can you, you have my uh, video. Uh, you need to activate my video. It says you've got me. Oh, I, that may be the case. Let's see if I can do something about that. It says the host has stopped it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Apologize for that. It looks like I'm the only one with uh, video privileges at the moment, so I will have to do something about that. So uh, format is a bit new to me, so I apologize.
Are you still there? <laughs> All right, so you should be able to start your video now. I think I've given you that privilege, so apologize that that wasn't already in place there. Uh, ah, there I am. I apologize that you didn't have that privilege to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. I was wondering why folks had chosen not to use their video function today. So it looks like we do have a, a good amount of us here today. Um, so we have 15 panelists. I know that includes some of us um, from staff, so I'm not sure that includes all of the uh, folks on the committee exactly, but we do have at least two thirds of the members here, um, more than that. And we have two folks from the public that are uh, witnessing uh, this meeting as well. So just a heads up on that. That's something that we had outlined in the bylaws and we'll be discussing that later in the meeting. So I guess with, <clears throat> with that said, it looks like we have um, a minimum of quorum, if not close to the whole committee here. Um, so I think I'll go ahead and get started. Um, you know, just one thing before I go any further, I just wanna verify, can folks hear me okay? I know that I've had issues with folks not being able to hear me before, so great. Thank you for confirming. Um, so I'll go ahead and share the agenda um, just to get this started. Apologies. Too many windows at once, apologies here. All right, so can folks see that all right? Yes. Hopefully it's legible. All right, so this is just uh, the agenda. You should have been sent this as well. Um, so hopefully you have another copy of this if you can't see it on the screen, but I'm hoping that you can. Um, so we'll start out with some introductions today. Um, you know, I think it's a good, uh, you know, sort of opportunity, you know, really to get uh, acquainted with one another and sort of a, a sense of the sort of scope of the folks that are included on the committee. Um, so really, you know, just to begin with, you know, really the, the purpose here is you know, a little bit of housekeeping, I suppose, the first uh, meeting um, of the advisory committee, we really wanted to establish the organization and management of things, um, you know, appoint um, a vice chair and a chair, and um, really talk about some of the work plan and key issues that we'll be tackling through the process as we move forward. Um, so with that being said, I'll uh, stop sharing here so that we can get going with some introductions. Um, if you can, um, you know, I guess what I'll do is just, uh, say uh, a name, essentially I'll have to be the MC here. Um, and uh, if you can just uh, state uh, again, your name, um, your affiliation, sort of how you're involved um, with the committee um, and sort of what your daily day-to-day uh, -day, um, profession is. Um, so, uh, or, you know, what you do, I guess, for a living or, or during the daytime. So uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get started with Randy Arthur. Oh, good evening. I'm Randy Arthur. I live in the Lakewood neighborhood of Lake Oswego, where I've lived for 12 years. I'm uh, the representative of the Development Review Commission. Are we getting feedback? Or can you hear me? Yeah, do you? Okay, I'm getting feedback, but it's okay. Um, and I formally, I'm a lawyer, a civil litigation attorney with the Bulletin Hauser Bailey in Portland law firm. I uh, previously served on the Planning Commission, and I'm uh, happy to work with you on this committee. It's great to have you here, Randy. Uh, thank you. Um, and just, I think there might be a little bit of feedback that we're getting, or at least an echo of some kind. So if, if folks, if they're not speaking, can uh, mute themselves, that might help with some of those issues. Um, so I guess I'll just kind of move uh, sort of around uh, the, the circle clockwise on my screen and go to Jamin next. 
Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Jamin Kimmel. I'm a uh, urban planner and uh, have been the project consultant for the city's middle housing uh, work, uh, kind of leading the project. So I'm with uh, Cascadia Partners. Uh, we're a, a local uh, planning and development consulting firm. And uh, so some of the work products that you uh, received in your packet are, are we've led um, as well as had a couple of sub consultants working on that. Uh, so I'll be continuing to kind of support the city um, as they move through this process to develop the, uh, the middle housing code amendments um, and working on several of these projects in some other communities around the state. So you're not alone in kind of grappling with uh, how to implement this new law and uh, look forward to working with you. Thanks, Jamin. I'll go on to Ross Masters. Uh, Ross Masters here to represent the uh, building industry. I run a company called Crosswater Development Company. We're an infill home builder and land developer. And I've got experience in Lake Oswego, uh, Washington County, uh, basically Southwest Portland, as well as I've uh, made some loans uh, to some other developers on uh, some infill projects in Portland that are specifically tied to cottage cluster. So got a little bit of experience there as well. Great, thanks Ross. Um, it's great to have you here. It's um, good to have somebody with that experience on the committee. Um, so uh, I guess moving forward, uh, uh, Rachel Cotton, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself. Sure, good evening everyone. My name is Rachel Cotton. I am also here as a consultant with Cascadia Partners. I'm an associate and I am helping out Jamin on the work um, that we're doing as a consulting team. Thanks Rachel. Um, Ralph Tarrant. Hi, everybody. I'm a local architect. I've been around here for uh, probably 45 years, I'd say. And, uh, oh, I do uh, um, quite a wide variety of development projects. And in Lake Oswego, I've done a lot of the big master plan developments. And uh, I still do a lot of single family and uh, housing design from, you know, little to bigger. And, um, and then I, I do a lot of work in the Portland metro area uh, anywhere. And right now I've got a affordable uh, prefabricated 11 story building going in for permits uh, this week in the city of Portland on a mass plywood uh, panel project, so quite interesting. So I'm involved in a lot of the newer uh, techniques, I guess I'd say. And uh, we do work basically up and down the, uh, the Western United States in about five states. So that's what, I've been a resident of Lake Oswego for about 45 years. So that's, that's how I come here. Thanks, Ralph. Um, appreciate that. Uh, we're, I just want to clarify, we'll also um, be reaching out to folks just to verify that we have the proper contact information for you. I think we have um, email addresses, at least for, for all of you, that should be the hopefully the best email address, but we just want to verify that we have that. So not only will we be verifying that with you, but we'll hopefully be sharing um, that contact information with the rest of the committee if, if uh, folks are comfortable with uh, doing so. Um, so just wanted to respond to that. I got a question um, just a moment ago from Lisa Strader. Um, so anyway, uh, I'll go to the next uh, person on my screen here, Stephanie Glazer. All right, hi, thank you for uh, including me. I'm excited to be part of this group um, and uh, looking forward to our uh, interesting and lively discussions, I'm sure. Uh, my background is in sustainability. My education is environmental engineering. Um, and I've spent a little over 20 years in sustainability consulting work. Um, I also serve on the Lake Oswego Sustainability Advisory Board. Um, and I've been in the city for six years. Um, so it's a pleasure to be with you on this committee. Thanks. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Um, we'll go on to Lisa Strader. Apologies if I'm mispronouncing names. Please, please let me know if I'm mispronouncing any names. That was just perfect, thanks. Good evening. Hi, I'm Lisa Strader. She, her pronouns. Um, I um, 
have been, I was a member of the DEI task force. I'm a current alternate on the DEI committee. Uh, professionally now, I'm an ADA coordinator uh, for the Portland Bureau of Transportation and previously was the ADA program manager for the um, Oregon uh, Department of Transportation. So ADA being the Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, prior to that, I've done a lot of project development, um, more like, um, PG Park, uh, the University of Oregon Law School, um, Amphitheater, Columbia River, Channel Deepening. So not a lot of housing, but um, as a volunteer, um, I've been involved with Catholic Charities and on the housing committee there for about 20 years. Um, so very uh, interested in um, being sure that we have housing options for um, a variety of people. Um, I've been a Lake Oswego resident for 30 plus years, and I'm really happy to be here. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. It's great to have you here. Um, I'll go on to Councilor Verdict. Hi, um, I'm your council representative. I'm also a building designer by day. I primarily do residential remodels and additions. I'm also a historic preservationist, and I've served on our city's historic resource advisory board. Um, as well as I serve on the Lake Oswego Preservation Society, and I've uh, served on our many or couple neighborhood associations. So I've worked with a variety of different uh, aspects of the code and also working with neighborhoods on how to update the code to have overlays and so forth. So fairly familiar. So I think that's why Joe um, asked me to be the council representative. I'm very happy to be here. Great. Thanks so much. It's great to have you here. All right, I'll go on to Samuel Goldberg. Hi, I'm Samuel Goldberg. I use he, him pronouns. I'm the Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing and uh, Land Use Specialist at the Fair Housing Council of Oregon. Um, I think that my slot is technically uh, for an affordable housing uh, organization. That's not technically what I do. It's a little bit different, but um, I'm, I'm happy to, to uh, uh, look out for those interests as well. Thanks, Samuel. Uh, yeah, I think we wanted to get somebody from the field of housing advocacy. So, so hopefully you feel that very broad uh, definition there as well. Um, so I'll, I'll go on to Tam Hickson. Hi, everyone. I'm Tam Hickson. My pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I see I'm listed as uh, the realtor on the list there. Uh, it's the professional hat I've worn for the last five years. Um, but I do have a background in higher education and the nonprofit sector. Uh, I live in the Oak Creek neighborhood, uh, serve on the Westwood HOA board, um, have two kids in the school district. And um, yeah, my work primarily focuses on first time home buyers and newcomers um, looking to build some general uh, generational wealth. So that's primarily who I support. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, Cynthia Johnson. Yes, um, I am, I came here to, I'm on the vice chair of the 50 plus advisory committee um, in Lake Oswego. Um, and it's noteworthy that our um, 2021 goals had um, issues related both to, I mean ha, related that both had affordable housing and accessibility mentioned in our goals so it's important that I rep that, represent that population um, I have was a I'm disabled um, by myalgic encephalomyelitis um, so no longer able to work often tethered to my bed or if you do see me out I'm probably in a scooter um, that said I uh, have lived here since 1988 uh, moved to Westlake area because the housing was affordable, interestingly enough, um, back in the day. And I now live in the first edition in an apartment. So I'm really happy to be here um, and look forward to working with all of you. And I, my former background was as a consultant and publicist, mostly in the nonprofit world prior to 2009. So thank you. Thanks, Cynthia. It's great to have you here. Yeah. Um, it's interesting that so many folks have different areas of expertise really that are you know both parallel and overlapping it's it's a, i think a good group here um so bob urban you're next on the list good evening everybody um i am uh the chair of the uplands neighborhood association and one of two uh 
board chairs represented on the committee. Um, lived in Lake Oswego or had a home in Lake Oswego for 38 years and have served on the Uplands board for uh, at least 15 years. Uh, and I've chaired it for 10 or so of those years. Um, so I, I am amazed at the diversity and skill of everyone else, uh, all the other panelists and look forward to working with y'all. It's great to have you here, Bob. Um, Carol Ocker, you're next. Hi all, um, I have an educational background in interpersonal neurobiology, the um, interfunctions of groups and individuals. Um, I've lived for over 35 years in various neighborhoods in Lake Oswego and various uh, different styles of housing in Lake Oswego. Um, I have, um, as uh, the chair of the Fan Forest Hills Neighborhood Association for a number of years, uh, served extensively in the land use process for the city of Lake Oswego, representing my neighborhood in um, many, many city pre-apps, projects, large and small. And I currently serve as the chair of the uh, Neighborhood Chairs Committee of Lake Oswego. Very glad to work with you this evening. Thanks, Carolyn. It's great that you're able to be here with us and appreciate just wanting to say everybody's time. I know that this is um, obviously, uh, you know, evenings that could be spent uh, otherwise. So we really appreciate your dedication and your your availability. Um, Larry Snyder, you're next. Good evening. Um, I am presently the chairman of the Historic Advisory Review Board for the city of Lake Oswego. I've been involved in preservation here for since about 1913. I've been on the board and still am on the board of the uh, Lake Oswego Preservation Society, as well as my work with the um, Advisory Review Board. I come from a, a background in historic preservation with a Master of Science degree in that field, and I've worked both in the for-profit and non-profit sector. Um, I moved here in 2001 from Philadelphia, and the, the background you see behind me is Japanese House and Garden in Philadelphia, which is a project I worked on uh, in, in the park there. And I'm looking forward to um, seeing what the impact may be of what we're going to be discussing on the current listed properties, historic properties in Lake Oswego, as well as those who may in the future become eligible for listing. Glad to be here, thank you. Thank you, Larry. It's glad, glad that you're able to join us. Um, and I think the last person that I have on the list, at least as a part of the committee that we need to introduce today is Todd Prager. Hi everyone, I'm Todd Prager. I'm a consulting arborist with Kerrigan Associates. Um, I'm also a certified planner. I do mainly consulting on development projects uh, throughout the Portland area and further around Oregon. Um, I also do consulting with cities, uh, working on updates to tree codes. And I've been working on a few updates of tree codes along with their middle housing code updates. So I've been living in Lake Oswego for 15 years and I'm excited to uh, contribute to this project. It's good to have you here, Tom. Um, and yeah, I, well, let's wait till last to introduce myself, but my name is Eric Olson. Um, I'm going to be doing my best to let other folks talk and uh, not just uh, blather on at you all, all meeting long. So I'll, I'll do my best to uh, facilitate an uh, open and inclusive conversation here. Um, but just to briefly talk about myself, um, I'm a senior planner with the city of Lake Oswego in the planning department. I am the lead um, here at the city uh, for the work to comply with House Bill 2001. Um, so I will be a facilitator, more or less, um, along with Jamin of our committee. And um, you know, I'm very much looking forward to all of uh, working with all of you. And um, we have a lot to lot to talk about. So um, you know, I think you know we should get to work. But I just again want to really, really um, you know thank everybody here for for making time to be on this committee because I you know I know that it's a it's a above and beyond, um, especially for folks that are already serving on uh, planning commissions and, and other sort of uh, entities. 
elsewhere. So, um, or commissions and boards and, and et cetera. So uh, moving forward on the agenda, um, we have, um, just to sort of briefly share that with you, we have a presentation from Jamin, just to sort of talk a little bit about um, both uh, what the state requirements are as we understand them and um, sort of some work that we've done um, so far this year to do some research and information gathering um, to develop some initial recommendations um, to move this process forward. So with that being said, I will hand things over to uh, Jamin Kimmel. Okay, let me um, share my screen here and I've got some slides to, to walk you through. Um, I first want to say that I know there's a couple of you on this uh, committee that uh, may have already seen this uh, presentation. So thanks for, for bearing with me if it's a little redundant, um, but we wanted to make sure, you know, everyone on the committee is up to speed on uh, the work that the city has done so far um, on kind of preparing to write code and to implement the middle housing requirements. Um, but also on what the requirements are themselves, um, because they um, uh, they are a, a kind of a new concept um, in residential uh, zoning and land use policy. Um, you know, Oregon is the first state to kind of have this level of um, uh, state uh, kind of, um, I don't know if I'd call it intervention or um, kind of, uh, uh, yeah, uh, restriction on, on local uh, authorities to regulate residential zoning. So um, for that reason is kind of a, some big concepts and, and um, some of the requirements that are important to, I think, um, start to become familiar with as well, they'll come up often as we start to talk about um, all the different types of issues and decisions that the, uh, the committee will be tasked to make. So what I'd like to cover today, let me get in presentation mode here. Uh, like I said, a bit of background on HB 2001. Uh, secondly, some information on uh, the process that we've uh, undertaken so far and our approach. Uh, give you kind of the, the thumbnail view, a snapshot of what our findings and recommendations are from kind of the study and background work that we've done today. And also coming out of some some initial community engagement on this topic. Um, and then leave some time for, for discussion and, and questions um, on the presentation. So starting with some background on House Bill 2001. So um, many of you probably, probably already know this, um, but just to, to reinforce, uh, it was passed in 2019 by the Oregon legislature. And it sets out to require that all cities uh, over uh, 25,000 in population or in the metro area, um, and which both of those apply to Lake Oswego. Um, but be, um, those cities must allow middle housing. So this new concept or term of middle housing is kind of introduced into the um, into statute here. And um, it requires cities to allow middle housing in addition to single family houses in all residential zones where single family houses are permitted. Um, so important to remember too, that this is not a uh, prohibition on single family uh, housing. Uh, the the HB 2001 has no provisions which require the city to deny development permits for single family housing, only requires you to allow a wider variety of housing. Uh, and it's out of a timeline that requires the cities to update their codes by June 30th of 2022. Uh, and so that's kind of the hard deadline by which the city needs to uh, have a, uh, their code be in compliance with the um, House Bill 2001 and the associated administrative rules that then implement uh, that new state law. So what is middle housing? And some of you have probably seen this graphic before. Um, it's also been called missing middle housing um, because uh, there's an urban planner uh, kind of coined the term with trying to capture the idea that these are some housing types that were formerly um, more likely to be developed in the kind of early 20th century uh, in the US. So if you look at older parts of 
like Oswego, older parts of Portland, Milwaukee, there, there is a greater predominance of these um, kinds of housing and they fall kind of in that middle ground between detached single family houses and larger kind of mid-rise apartment buildings. Uh, and there's kind of a, a wide variety of them. Um, and uh, so this new concept of middle housing was very useful for thinking about okay, some different kinds of housing may be appropriate to integrate into neighborhoods that have predominantly single family housing because they're of a similar scale and character, although they may have more units kind of in the building or on the site. So that's kind of the broad idea. And in terms of the Oregon law, Oregon really looked at five types of middle housing and they generally correspond with those terms that I uh, highlighted there. So duplex, triplex, and fourplex. Uh, this, on, on this uh, version of this graphic, it's called a bungalow court. The, the, uh, the parallel term for that would be cottage cluster uh, and townhouses. So I'll go in a little bit on what those are just to make sure it's, a, it's very clear. So a duplex is um, a, um, when you have two units on one lot. And the um, uh, typical configuration is for those two units to be atta attached, uh, like is shown in the example there. Uh, that said, the law does not require uh, that cities um, define a duplex only as two attached units. They could also be two detached uh, units as well. So that's just important to keep in mind. And House Bill 2001 requires that duplexes be allowed on all lots where single family houses are allowed. So any lot where a single family house is allowed, duplex must also be allowed. So then there's triplexes and quadplexes, which are similar concept, just three or four units on one lot, so the two units. And those must be allowed in terms of the, uh, the language of the bill and the statute, it must be allowed in areas zoned for residential use that also allow single family housing. And um, so the statute gave a little bit of um, flexibility um, to define where um, those types of middle housing could potentially be allowed. Um, but since then, the city or the state has adopted administrative rules, which specify that more clearly of where, what types of locational restrictions the city can apply. Um, to middle housing. So while that is a very vague language there, we have much more specific guidance, which I'll, I'll get to a bit in, in a few minutes here. So then there's two more, uh, so townhouses. And so the distinction here is that townhouses could look a lot like a triplex or fourplex or even a duplex. The difference here is that the units are on individual lots, uh, right? So they share a, a common wall, um, but the lot line uh, runs along that common wall and they are two separate lots. Um, so that's um, the definition of, of townhouses and cities must allow at least four attached units uh, in a townhouse project. Uh, and then there's cottage cluster, which is a kind of different twist on all of this. Uh, and a cottage cluster is kind of a more specific form or design of, of housing. Um, some of the key characteristics of it are, you know, the word cottage, these are smaller units. Uh, these are not 2000 square foot houses or 3000 square foot houses. These are a thousand square feet. Um, they are oriented around a common courtyard. Um, they have a certain amount of common open space. Um, and so it's, it's a popular concept that several developers, many developers actually have been starting to build more of. Uh, and the, the statute and the rules actually kind of um, uh, require cities to allow them in this form. Uh, and so cottage clusters can range from, uh, I believe starts at five cottages on one site to up to 12, uh, I think it's 12 all around one courtyard. So this could be a larger project, uh, but there are limits on this. The cities are allowed to apply limits on the size of the cottages. So why did the, the state pass House Bill 2001? So 
kind of reading between the lines and knowing some of the uh, the background on the legislation, I think there's kind of three big goals. And one of them is more options. So um, having the opportunity to build uh, smaller units in more locations is what one thing that middle housing is one of the advantages of that compared to only allowing uh, single family detached houses on larger lots. Uh, it's also part of a larger kind of um, housing supply initiative uh, on part of the state just to get more housing built um, because we know there's a major shortage of housing overall in the state. And um, I think the state of Oregon wants to um, uh, not go the way the state of California has and, and produce more housing and try to meet that uh, supply um, or meet the demand uh, as we're seeing you know, continued migration and population growth. Uh, and then there's also kind of a diversity and an equity goal here too. So one of the ideas behind middle housing is that if you allow a mix of different housing types, some of which might be more affordable than single family detached houses, that will result in a greater mix of um, demographic and, um, and uh, income-based, potentially even uh, racial makeup of the community. So there's some of that is also kind of part of, I think, some of the intent for uh, House Bill 2001. So House Bill 2001 applies to uh, all of Lake Oswego's residential zones. So all of Lake Oswego's residential zones allow single family housing. Uh, and so therefore uh, they are subject to the requirements of House Bill 2001. Uh, it's important to note that on this map we show all of the areas that are um, zoned and allow single family housing in green. There are plenty of places outside of that where you see residential development, but where um, it might be in a commercial zone, it might be uh, you know, only allowed as a mixed use development. Um, so example, some of the um, developments um, uh, in the um, Cruiseway area, things like, uh, like that. House Bill 2001 doesn't apply to those commercial and mixed use zones. So we're really focused on the residential zones for this project. Uh, we also have kind of hatched in the uh, areas of, that are within the city, uh, city's kind of um, uh, urban growth management area. So they are not in the city um, right now, but they are in uh, the county. But were they to be in the city, they would be zoned. If, were they to add annex, they would be zoned under a residential uh, zone that allows single family. And at that point, House Bill 2001 would become applicable to those. Um, for most of those uh, cases, uh, the zoning will be updated by the time uh, those um, properties uh, annex if they do. So something to keep in mind is those county lands uh, as long as they're in the county, they're not subject to the city's House Bill 2001 uh, code, but they uh, will be subject to some of the county's House Bill 2001 requirements. And the county does have some separate uh, requirements. So um, to give you kind of a, a, a brief overview of how the administrative rules work um, and what they say um, about how a city is going to come into compliance with um, the uh, House Bill 2001. Um, so I think something first I should, should um, point out that's not on this slide is that there is um, the Department of Land Conservation and Development, DLCD, who's tasked with implementing these um, House Bill 2001, uh, wrote a model code for uh, middle housing. And the model code is intended to uh, be the code that would apply if a city does not have does not have code that complies with the administrative rules. And so the idea there is it's kind of a backstop for, um, uh, and it's actually an incentive for cities to comply with the administrative rules because if they don't, the model code will will apply. Um, the model code is fairly um, permissive of middle housing uh, development. It does have some good design and development standards, um, but they are, it would not be um, kind of customized to Lake Oswego. Um, and so uh, an overarching 
assumption with this project and the city's approach has been, we'd like to develop our own code that complies with the rules and not rely on the model code um, to regulate middle housing. So with that in mind, there's kind of two tracks for um, uh, approval under those administrative rules. And the first one kind of deals with where is middle housing permitted. So which lots or which areas uh, would uh, property owners be allowed to build middle housing. And so there's generally two um, categories here of the tracks. So the green ones are uh, what is kind of termed in the rules, the minimum compliance uh, track. And so uh, those are uh, fairly straightforward and objective uh, benchmarks. And I'll, sh I'll give you an example of what that is uh, shortly. Um, but the uh, approval is, um, there is no interpretation or discretion that the OCD would have to apply to determine whether a city's code complies with the rules. They're very straightforward, numerical, objective rules. Um, the orange um, uh, boxes that I've shown here are the alternative tracks. And there's a couple different kinds of that. Uh, but to, along the question of where is middle housing permitted, there is this idea of a performance metrics track. And basically what that says if, is if you, um, if the city uh, adopts any minimum lot size or de maximum density standards that don't comply with the minimum compliance standards, then they must show that they meet these performance metrics criteria. And the performance metrics have to do with the number of lots where uh, a middle housing type is allowed as a proportion of all the, all the residential lots in the city. So for example, if you decide to require a uh, larger minimum lot size for a quadplex, than what it would be allowed under the state rules under the minimum compliance, then you need to show the state that your rules would allow for quadplexes to be allowed on 70% of all residential lots. So there is a track for doing that. And this is something Thing we explored in the first phase of the work. Uh, and uh, our conclusion from that is that there is not a lot of upside for the city to pursue that performance metrics track. And we could talk about that more if we want, but the direction from the planning commission and the city council was that we'd like to pursue the minimum compliance track for lot size and density um, because the state rules are so structured for the performance metrics approach that um, if you go that route, uh, you will probably end up allowing middle housing in more places uh, than you would otherwise. And it becomes much more complex uh, uh, for the city to uh, both write the code to be compliant with it, to get approval from DLCD, and then to kind of administer and maintain it over time. There's a few, few reasons why the city is kind of as far as this stage selected to go the minimum compliance track. So that's a question of where is middle housing developed? There's also the issue of how is middle housing permitted? And so are you assuming you know which lots where middle housing will be allowed? Kind of what are the siting and design standards that apply to the development of middle housing? Uh, and again, here there's a minimum compliance track and then there's an alternative. Uh, and it depends on whether um, the uh, uh, standard is classified as a siting standard or a design standard of what the kind of minimum compliance is. So siting kind of has more to do with where the building is located on the lot, how tall it is, how overall, how large it is, how much parking is required, uh, while design has to more to do with the specific form of the building. Uh, so we'll get more into some of this uh, shortly after that, but it's important to remember these, these two tracks and they're kind of the, um, the um, direction from the Planning Commission and City Council is to uh, pursue the minimum compliance track uh, across all these different types of standards um, and to avoid going for the performance metric or the alternative uh, design standards approval. 
So this is an example of a minimum compliance standard. Um, so this is how the rules are structured for um, uh, the minimum lot sizes that the city can require for mental housing. So this is lo a lot of minimums in here. So <laughs> I'll try to track you through it. Basically what this says is that the state has set a cap on the minimum lot size that a city can require for a mental housing type. And it varies based on the minimum lot size that the city applies to single family detached housing. So you take, for example, for quadplexes. So if you're a single family minimum lot size or in a zone, uh, so let's take the R10 zone in Lake Oswego, a single family lot size, minimum lot size is 10,000 square feet. So that would fit under this third category of 7,000 square feet or higher. And in that case, the city cannot require of a quadplex a minimum lot size that is any greater than is required for a single family house. So that's the that's how kind of the minimum compliance standards work. They're pretty straightforward, they're objective. Uh, either you meet them or you don't. Um, so um, that's just to give you an example, we'll dive more into this in future discussions, I'm sure. Um, but to kind of characterize what the rules um, uh, say about the design and uh, development of mental housing. And, um, you know, basically this, the rules give more control to the city over uh, the design and the character, kind of the scale of mental housing in terms of um, its form and what it looks like and how it relates to the lot and the neighboring properties. Uh, the city gives, or the state rules give Quite a bit of latitude in the city to regulate that. Uh, they don't give much latitude in um, issues of uh, which lots can middle housing can be built, how dense can it be, so some pretty strict limitations on maximum density, um, and also on the number of parking spaces that um, a city can require for middle housing. So that's a bit of background on HB 2001. Um, and so all of that informed our, um, our approach to the first phase of this work. Um, but I wanna talk a little bit more about uh, the work we did to try to kind of prepare the city to, to develop some compliant code. And one of the things I think the city was smart to do with this project, which I think was different from other cities that, I, that I've worked with was they decided to take the first portion of the kind of first half of this year, and especially in the spring, to take stock of uh, what do people value about the residential neighborhoods in us Lake Oswego? What are the important uh, patterns and characteristics um, and the character of the neighborhood that people really uh, want to make sure is preserved? With the idea that that's the kind of the thing we're focused on. Those, those are the, that's what the city wants to make sure doesn't change significantly with this change in residential zoning. We want the basic character of the neighborhood to be similar as it is today, especially in on, you know, on the, um, in the ways that people value it at most. Um, even if it means that there are these different housing types and higher densities and potentially a little more uh, cars and traffic, um, what are the essential characteristics that, we, that the city wants to make sure are preserved? I think that was a smart idea to kind of step back and, and look at that um, question. And so we spent the first half of the year looking at, at a lot at that, did some um, interviews with neighborhood associations, some, um, some uh, virtual community engagement, um, so some uh, a primarily an online survey. We also looked and did an audit of the city's comprehensive plan and development code to identify what uh, sections will need to be amended. And then we developed some, some kind of options for implementation. And so I um, uh, wanted to highlight just a few things from the, um, from the survey that we did. We had a great response. So 880 total survey respondents. That's actually the most I've ever got in my career as a planner. Uh, so Lake Oswego residents are, are passionate about their neighborhood and community. Um, um, we had, a, I think, a good cross-section of different neighborhoods. Um, and the things we asked about in the survey were about those characteristics that people value. And we got a good sense of what's really important to people 
and that informs some of our recommendations to how to approach these middle housing, uh, middle housing code. Um, here's just kind of a word cloud of some of the things that we that we um, we heard that were um, very important. So we, we both asked some straightforward kind of rating questions, but then we also had a, an open-ended question, and that's a lot of good, interesting comments from that that I think informed our approach. We also did some quantitative analysis. So we did in-depth look at um, the existing development patterns in the city and how that varies across different neighborhoods and residential zones. Uh, and we went out and did um, some field visits where we, we drove around the city and, and took pictures and got some weird looks from people as they saw a caravan of three different cars with three different people in them because it's some COVID and we didn't want all to be in the same car. <laughs> um, but it was very useful uh, for us to make sure that our, our kind of um, understanding of the character of these various neighborhoods was, um, was accurate uh, based on the experience on the ground. Uh, so the work products we put together to kind of summarize this work are, one is the neighborhood character report. Um, the second is the plan and code audit summary, which is more in a memo format. And the last is the middle housing opportunities report. And that looks at the different um, kind of uh, options the city has and some recommendations for how to move forward. So we'll be referencing these documents, I think, throughout this process. You probably already saw those in your packet and some kind of there was a table that related some of the key issues we we're gonna discuss with where that information is in, in each of these reports. Um, so keep in mind as we'll be referencing these as we go forward. So what, what are some of those key findings and recommendations? I'll try to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, so the first is that um, the, um, the character of kind of the individual neighborhoods in um, uh, the city when I say neighborhoods here, I mean the neighborhood um, uh, association boundaries. Um, while some of those vary, there is a lot that's shared across neighborhood um, association boundaries. And so one of the things we wanted to do is if we're, we're going to try to kind of describe what the existing character of each of these neighborhoods are, we need to kind of map out some boundaries that might cross over what the neighborhood boundaries are and think about these more in terms of uh, character areas. So we identified these character areas that are shown in this map here. And what we did is tried to provide um, a profile and a description of the character of that area that we think is, um, that people value uh, and that is important to the overall look and feel of the neighborhood. Uh, and that might be affected by middle housing development. And so each of those character areas has this profile and so what I look forward to doing is we start to, to work through um, draft uh, code proposals is to compare back to these character areas and think about how they'd work in these various contexts. Um, because uh, the city's residential zones, to a degree, respond to some of these character areas, but sometimes they don't. So this will be an interesting look at, okay, what, what are, how are these neighborhoods different in ways that might matter in terms of how we want to regulate housing development. So this should be a good resource for that work. Um, so as part of that survey, we also, um, uh, as part of that work, the this, this survey also gave us some good um, direction on what people find kind of desirable on city in the different neighborhoods. And this kind of chart just kind of shows you some of the things that um, across neighborhoods were more desirable. And those are start on the left with the blue bar. And then um, there is um, the, the green um, uh, dots, which show uh, the percent of people in that neighborhood who felt their neighborhood had that characteristic. So there are some examples of things where they're very common in the neighborhood and they're part of the character, but they're not actually that desirable or people don't necessarily want them. So one of the things that we saw was garages being kind of visually dominant from the street. It's pretty common that green dot is very high, um, but it didn't score very high on it being a desirable feature of the neighborhood. Uh, so we wanted to distinguish between that of like, what, what do people see in their neighborhood that they really um, value and like and want to see more of uh, versus what's just there now, but it's not necessarily something we want to preserve. So we got a good sense of that. So one of the, like I mentioned, one of the broad 
recommendations uh, and conclusions we, we drew from this process was that uh, the city should move forward with meeting the minimum compliance standards for lot size and density. So not to pursue that performance metrics track, which would entail some additional locational restrictions on middle housing. So that might look like in certain neighborhoods, only certain middle housing types are allowed and others and more middle housing types are allowed. So that type of approach based on the rules that the state has written just is not going to be very fruitful. And so we don't recommend going that direction. The planning commission, the council uh, concurred with that. So what this basically means is that the city's regulations will focus less on where middle housing types are allowed or develop or um, uh, the, rephrase that, they'll focus more on the scale and character of the building uh, and how it relates to the lot and less on the number of units on the lot or the number of units in the building. Um, and also less on where various housing types are allowed. So it's gonna be more of a focus on, okay, let's just regulate the form and character of the, of the building and not limit it to certain areas because we assume that it cannot be compatible with that. Similarly, we looked at the, what the city might do to uh, comply with the requirements around minimum parking standards. And our initial recommendation on that is that um, the um, city should not pursue the alternative uh, track approval in order to keep their current minimum parking requirements. And so um, in order to do that, which the current city standard is between one and one and a half spaces per unit are required, House Bill 2001 generally limits cities to requiring no more than one space per unit. And so what this means, the city will need to lower their minimum uh, off-street parking requirement to meet that standard. Um, if they don't do that, the city would need to provide a justification that the, uh, their proposed standard does not cause unreasonable cost or delay to middle housing. Um, that's a discretionary standard. It's objective. It requires um, a detailed financial analysis. And in our judgment, it's unlikely to be approved. And it also op uh, opens up the cities to opportunities for that to be challenged um, uh, legally. Um, and so um, uh, it's also important to note that this is a minimum parking requirement required by the city, but it does not affect how much, there is no maximum parking uh, standards. So developer at any point could provide more than that minimum if they judge that would make their project more successful. Uh, so another thing we heard is that um, the from the survey respondents is that people generally care more about kind of the size and proportions, so the scale of buildings and less about their kind of architectural style or features. So this was a good finding to kind of um, to hear is that I in, 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 in kind of aligns with what we uh, saw in the development code is that um, there are several areas in Lake Oswego that have uh, architectural style uh, or design standards. Uh, and um, I think the, the finding we came out of this work um, with is that um, most of those areas that already have architectural design standards feel like they um, have the standards they need to also then apply to middle housing. Many of the other areas don't have a um, consistent architectural kind of character or heritage that they want to um, preserve. So broadly, I think some of the design standards um, would focus more on the bulk and massing of the new buildings um, and less on the architectural style. Uh, one of the things about architecture, though, that people were fairly clear about is kind of how the building relates to the street. And so um, you know, facades that are kind of dominated by a garage on the front facade are, are not necessarily um, uh, desirable from um, the perspective of the um, residents and the, and the respondents to the surveys. 
Uh, and we think this is an important issue to look at closely with middle housing. So that example up on the top left is a, is a row of townhouses with front facing garages in every unit, fairly wide driveways. And then the one below is, is similar kind of form of townhouses, but the garages are all in the back um, in a rear loaded alley. And I think what we've heard, the form on the left and the bottom is really what people uh, prefer more. It, it creates a better relationship to the street and um, kind of a sense of more pedestrian friendly place. Um, and so we recommended looking more closely at some of those the city's existing standards about the design of garages and driveways and tailoring them to make sure they are working for middle housing. Uh, another feature we found that people really um, liked about their neighborhoods is, is the mature landscaping. And that's one of the challenges with new infill development is landscaping's not going to be mature right when it's built. Um, but there are some things the city can do to try to kind of elevate their landscaping standards to address that issue. And so we've made some recommendations on some kind of front yard or foundation landscaping. We think that kind of can help soften the edges of, of new infill development um, that's likely to happen. Uh, another thing that we, we, we heard a lot about is um, concerns and uh, desire to see more uh, mature trees preserved with development. And um, one thing that we wanted to um, point out with middle housing is that there may actually be an opportunity here for the city to try to preserve more trees with new development. So one of the things that is interesting about middle housing types is that um, as you're allowed to have more units on one lot, there is some incentive on the part of developers to provide more smaller units, which in some ways can be easier to design around existing trees than one large house. Um, and this kind of clustering can make it easy, somewhat easier to preserve more trees. Uh, at the same time, the city may need to have some new limits on overall paving or impervious services. That's an issue that's come up in the past and it's related to stormwater management. Um, but our recommendation was to focus on some, some other new incentives to uh, try to encourage preservation of existing mature trees. Um, similarly, one of the things people really wanted to see more of is infill development that took the form of a conversion or an addition to single family houses. And the um, uh, House Bill 2001 rules are very um, friendly to this idea and want to support conversions or additions versus kind of wholesale redevelopment uh, of, of housing. Uh, and we, so we think that's a, also a, um, a kind of fruitful uh, opportunity for the city to focus on is what kinds of incentives or requirements might kind of steer uh, middle housing development towards keeping the existing house on the lot and adding to it, converting it, building around it to create another housing unit. Uh, so would it effectively be a cottage cluster or a duplex? Uh, just the one of the units might be the existing house. So lastly, um, there's also an opportunity to address housing affordability with um, the middle housing uh, code amendments. And so uh, we heard this as, as a priority and um, one of the um, things that can, um, middle housing can be, uh, because you have higher density of housing and allow smaller housing, uh, it can be more uh, attractive and feasible for uh, either a market, either a private developer or a nonprofit uh, developer that wants to provide affordable housing can make it easier for them to do that uh, in more locations than they can now. So there's an opportunity there but some, the city will need to modify some of their financial incentives and code incentives uh, if they want to try to encourage that more so that more of the new middle housing is actually income restricted affordable housing. Okay, hope I didn't go too far over there. I tried to go quick. Um, I will stop sharing so we can discuss but I can bring up any other slides if people have questions. Yeah, and you know, I think we can use a, um, you know, either just raise your hand if you'd like, or use the raise hand function if you'd like to ask a question. But um, certainly, if you if you do have those, um, please let us know.
Go ahead, Randy. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Uh, I did have a question. Uh, you had referred to the model code, as I understood it, if the city didn't satisfy the deadline for proposing and adopting its own code. Do we have a copy of the model code in our materials? Eric, I don't recall whether what one was included. Yeah, you know, you may not have a copy of the model code, but I can certainly respond. You know, there's, um, it's essentially included in the administrative rules that were adopted by the state. So I will make sure that folks have a link to those administrative rules that include that model code and I will point out what code section includes the model code. So um, apologies oh. if we didn't have that already. Oh no, I just was curious. And the other question I had was, um, are the state minimum compliance standards identical to the model code or are they different? The minimum compliance standards are, are different. That's a good question. So the model code is written to be a, um, it's written like a development code. So if, if um, a developer came in and applied for a permit, the city could apply the model code and effectively regulate some of the key um, uh, issues with um, development. The minimum compliance standards are written as they apply to the city's zoning code. And so they are not a, um, meant to apply to a specific development project. So they do provide some ranges, right? It says you can have a minimum lot size can be no greater than single family minimum lot size. Uh, one of the standards is you can apply a design standard to middle housing so long as you apply the same design standard to single family housing. Now you can have different standards that are more restrictive for middle housing. So it's, it's written a little bit differently. The intent is to, for those to be standards by which the zone, the city's zoning code is evaluated. I see, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Stephanie. There, thanks. Just as a follow-up to that, um, and thanks for that clarification. Um, is the city open to changing development code and, and other standards um, beyond just the design standards, um, like specifically around um, the zoning, you know, R, I don't know all the right terminology, but like R10, R15, um, is that open for discussion or consideration or is um, some of the setback requirements open for discussion um, in addition to those design standards as you talked about? Certainly, yeah, I think um, when I say maybe um, design, it, it's not only design standards, like actually we should, we should broaden that a bit. Um, but I think the types of things the city will be open to revising um, are, are things like setbacks, maximum height, maximum lot coverage and floor area ratio. Um, they, um, I think all of those are on the table. I'm not sure if, um, if uh, the city is wanting to kind of remap where the zone districts apply. I don't think that is considered part of the scope now, and Eric can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, the, the idea would probably be same zoning districts and zoning map. It's just the standards that regulate development within those areas would be amended. That's correct. Yeah, we would, um, we would not be looking at any of the sort of underlying comprehensive plan designations being changed which are kind of what inform the zoning district in a particular area. Um, there might be some other sort of language in the comp plan that would need to be updated or addressed, but for the most part, we aren't looking at replanning, you know, the, the um, different zoning districts that are mapped around the city. All right, Cynthia? Thanks. Does it, I know the lines are a little fuzzy, but what, does the, any of this impact um, progress we've made or zoning on accessory dwelling units, be they external or internal to a house? No, it's, um. so ADUs are actually a separate category from middle housing. Okay. It's, it's funny because they're, they, they are sometimes grouped together. Yeah. Um, so the, the, under the law, it does not, the, the law does not require the city to amend any of their uh, requirements um, around middle housing or around um, accessory dwelling units. Um, however, there may need to be some uh, kind of 
uh, evaluation of those in light of the middle housing allowances. Um, uh, for the most part, I don't think that they'll become more restrictive. There's probably more of a clarification. Like sometimes it's unclear whether a property with a single family house and an ADU, is that, an, is that a single family house and an ADU or is it a duplex? So there's just some kind of clarity things that may need to happen, but I don't yeah. imagine major changes to the ADU rules. Good. It was the term like detached duplex that I wondered, you know, that can be yeah. <laughs> two cottages really. So, okay, we'll talk about that. Thank you. I just was kind of a little clarity. Uh, Lisa. Thanks. Yes, this is Lisa. So just as a follow on to Cynthia's, I thought the same thing when I saw some of the building on the on existing lots, I wondered if that was an overlap with ADU or how you would distinguish one from the other. Um, that isn't why I raised my hand though. Um, I'm wondering if um, we, if any information that we've gathered or if there's anything that's easily gathered to tell us how many housing units, current zoning in each of the neighborhoods um, are allowed versus how many we have there now to give us sort of a capacity um, snapshot. Does that make sense? Right. I might defer to Eric on this one, but that is typically that type of study is usually done as part of a housing needs analysis. And we kind of take stock of your existing housing supply and then compare it to your projected growth and your zoned capacity for housing. I think the city did one in 2013, if I'm correct, Eric. That's correct, yeah, and we will be needing to update our housing needs analysis um, for 2023, actually. So that's something that we're going to be needing to comply with for HB 2003. Um, and there will be new sort of, uh, you know, sort of a new iteration of um, this for HB 2003, rather, um, called the Housing Production Strategies um, sort of process that will also be um, required to sort of analyze these throughout that whole sort of um, exercise. So that's something that's kind of, on, on the table, but it's just kind of not um, necessarily a part of the scope for what we're hoping to, um, you know, uh, accomplish in time for the deadline of June 30th right. of next year. Um, but uh, Samuel, um, if you can clarify for us a little bit about that question, that would be helpful. I think you have some input to offer there. Uh, I'm, that is my, my understanding as well. Okay, I, I, I guess that's another question then. <laughs> yeah, I think there's like a, a broader point there. It's important to keep in mind is that, um, this code change is coming as a compliance with a state requirement. So it's kind of different than what typically happens where you have a planning process and you look at some things like that and then you do a code change to implement that. And so things are a little reverse order here, but what I think is going to happen is that cities will need to comply with the requirement. And then in the future, as they update their general housing plans, general infrastructure plans, their transportation plan, that will change some of their assumptions about how much growth uh, is expected in various neighborhoods and where it'll be um, because there's these new zoning allowances. Um, and so that will be something the city will have to grapple with. It just, it'll be as they update the mas master plans for these various kind of parts of the city. Yeah, I noticed that you, in, in one of the documents, I can't remember what it was, it, it mentioned that it, uh, an update to the comp plan was not immediately required, but that, yeah, yeah they, they would be under those assumptions, yeah. This is Lisa, may I just offer follow on since you're answering my question? Please. Would that be okay? Thank you. Um, I'm just, one of the reasons I asked is, um, maybe some of the open-ended questions. I know that there were some of those in the neighborhood report. Um, those are more, they felt more like what people liked about their neighborhood or some of the maybe basic important things that was just a snapshot of sort of what things looked like or how things felt. I didn't know if there were any concerns expressed about capacity or um, resources or access to parks if more people are moving in. And I just thought it might be helpful if we knew, you know, this neighborhood is zoned this and that would allow this many dwelling units and we have this many, so we have this much capacity if we needed to sort of give some, an explanation of 
some of the decisions that were made or, or the recommendations, I should say, that were made. So that, that was what I was thinking more than logistically, literally, do we have a document that's due related to this? So thanks for the right. information. Yeah, yeah, I think on that broader point, I, I think I would, um, so yes, infrastructure, capacity, um, traffic, parking, uh, school capacity, all of those things um, are, were issues that were brought up uh, in the survey and that have been brought up uh, in other ways. So we don't mean to, um, uh, to gloss over those as they're not important issues. Um, but I think the, um, uh, the kind of um, approach that the city has to take with this at this now is like I said, is to update the zoning to allow it and then catch up the planning later to try to address some of those issues. Um, at the same time, one of the provisions in the rule is that um, if the city uh, deems any particular development project to, uh, that there is not sufficient infrastructure to support that project, the city still is allowed to uh, reject the permit so long as the developer is not willing to uh, make the infrastructure improvements necessary. Um, so there is still an opportunity for cities to make sure that infrastructure improvements are put in place to try to, you know, manage the new growth. Um, but it's, uh, it, it won't be part of this planning process, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I think, um, yeah, just to sort of add to that, you know, we did uh, discuss a bit of the sort of potential infrastructure implications with the Planning Commission, and we did bring in um, City Engineer Eric Rooney. So we do have some information in a previous um, staff report that we delved into this a bit further. Um, but, you know, suffice to say that, you know, I think just to, to support what Jamin um, was just uh, mentioning, you know, there is a sort of general concept adopted by the state, whereas, you um, you know, cities aren't necessarily able to preclude the development of middle housing based on infrastructure because there should be, um, the idea is that the opportunity should be provided for developers to provide needed infrastructure in the case that it is not available already. Um, so we did, you know, take a look at at least some of the sort of infrastructure planning that had been conducted on a citywide scale and, you know, the growth assumptions um, that we would assume um, based on sort of implementation of this in, in other areas um, you know, the, the engineering department didn't have concerns that that wouldn't be able to, to be addressed on that sort of project by project um, basis. Um, so, you know, I think Ralph, you might have had your uh, uh, question in the air there or your hand in the air there for a bit longer than some of the folks with their digital hands raised. So I'll, I'll go to Ralph here first. Thanks, Eric. <clears throat> Um, I'm wondering, you know, as I've been listening to the presentation, which I thought was excellent. Um, okay, so in Lake Oswego, we've got a number of large planned developments that have been developed and accepted for 25, 30, 40 years such as Mountain Park, which makes up roughly about 5,000 people in our, you know, I might be low, and uh, Westlake, which I had a major portion of doing, and uh, like Westridge, in, uh, and, and then Bryant Woods. Those are very large communities that were all very, you know, diligently planned and uh, the, uh, densities were set up. Actually, there are a number of a variety of housing types and all of those. And so now I'm wondering, are, are they all subject to House Bill 2001? In my thoughts, you could only do a planned development and do more restrictive um, development regulations than less. You know, you had to at least meet the city's requirements, but you could be more restrictive. And in my memory and in doing work in each one of these developments over the years, they are all more restrictive. And so do, do they get a set aside or, and I yeah. think you'd have to kind of look at that in the overall context of, 
Lake Oswego and see, mm -hmm. all right, you know, how, how, how much of the population does that affect? I don't know. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a really great point. And I think we should keep in mind as the context here for how Hospital 2001 is likely to affect the, the city. Um, so there's kind of, I wanna separate it into two parts. So there is the zoning rules that the state applies, or I mean, excuse me, the city applies to those master plan communities. And um, I, I believe and assume so that most of those or all of those were probably developed through a, a PD or plan development process and were approved under that process. And um, what House Bill 2001 says about those master plan communities uh, is that um, if those um, master plans um, had already been adopted by a certain date, which I think we've already passed now, um, then um, the um, city is uh, not required to comply with all of the provisions of House Bill 2001. So they're not required to allow all new housing, uh, all middle housing types in those master plan communities that were previously approved. Um, they do have to allow duplexes on every lot and they do have to allow a, um, um, I believe it's a minimum of 15 units per acre um, density throughout the whole uh, plan community. Um, so there are some separate provisions that apply to those areas. Um, those provisions only apply to the undeveloped portions of those master plan communities. They um, do not apply to redevelopment uh, within those communities. So the single family house uh, within one of those master plan communities could, if, it, if that was proposed to be redeveloped, it would, um, the city would need to allow whatever the base residential zoning allows, which must be in compliance with Hospital 2001. So that that's the one part. The other part's really important though too, is that Hospital 2001 does not negate pre-existing uh, covenants, conditions, and restrictions. So CCNRs, which are adopted by usually a private homeowners association, those are a private contractual agreement between the homeowners and that association about what types of housing and architecture and how the community will function, right? Uh, many of you might have those on, in, on your property. So if those existed prior to uh, 2020, uh, then, and those CCNRs precluded middle housing, they're still legitimate and those HOAs can continue to enforce that preclusion. So if they said single family housing was only allowed in this, in this uh, community, uh, those are still enforceable. New, mass, new um, planned communities and new CCNRs cannot restrict middle housing types, uh, but pre-existing can. So it's, it's very different. So our focus will really be on the zoning rules because the CCNRs are a private agreement. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that those places that do have CCNRs that prohibit middle housing, even if the zoning has changed, effectively, it's unlikely to happen because of the HOA has the authority then to, um, to prohibit it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Jamie and Ralph. Um, I guess we'll go to Ross Masters next. Yeah, my question is, is tied to Senate Bill 458 and whether or not we need to have that in the back of our mind in, in terms of this discussion with, with uh, 2001. That's a very good question. That's uh, that's breaking news. <laughs> I don't know, J Jamin, do you wanna give a broad perspective on that and I can, I can sort of fill in the blanks? Sure. So um, just when we thought we got a handle on the new rules, um, the legislature this last session in 2021 uh, passed another middle housing related legislation. And so we're still kind of like getting a grasp on what exactly this means. Uh, but my, yeah, um, you know, basic understanding of it for now is that um, Senate Bill 458 requires cities that um, permit middle housing 
um, to also permit land divisions to allow the division of lots on a middle housing site uh, into individual fee simple lots. So the idea behind all this was that, well, we, we, the, the intent of the legislature was not with the original House Bill 2001 was not only to um, allow for new rental housing properties, which most fourplexes would be built as a rental property, um, primarily because condominium laws are um, challenging and, and, and risky for developers and they tend not to do that. And so there's just not many small condominiums that get built. And so to address that issue, the legislature tried to create this opportunity where uh, lots could be divided. So if you had a fourplex uh, and it was originally designed for on one lot as four rental units, it could make, potentially be divided into four lots that are uh, individually owned. Yeah, so as Jamin was saying, you know, we're still trying to sort of under understand the rulemaking implications and timeline for when we need to comply with that. But um, it looks like it might be on the same timeline as our other code adoption changes based on the language in the legislation. So that will become a topic. Uh, unfortunately, it's a late breaking topic. Um, so, you know, that's something that we'll have to build into our scope as we move forward. Um, so it's a, a good question, very relevant. Um, and, you know, I just want to make sure I know, Carol, you have your, your hand raised right now. I know I saw other hands raised, including um, Samuel Goldberg, I believe, and Todd Prager and Larry Snyder. So I don't know if you meant to lower your hand or if you still have a question, but I just wanted to make sure that you're addressed as well. Uh, Lisa actually put my question in the chat. Yep. Okay, so uh, I, I'll go ahead and address that then first. I think, you know, just the... Um, and so I, I'm assuming that's the question about, do we have an, a map of where the existing HOA restrictions might apply or other sort of codes, covenants and restrictions that might preclude the development of middle housing? Um, unfortunately, the answer is no. Um, it's and it's very, very, very large scope um, for, for that to be undertaken. And, you know, I think unfortunately that has been a pretty, pretty recurring issue, um, you know, that has come up with some of the conversations around the implementation of House Bill 2001 that, you know, effectively, even though zoning would allow it, um, effectively there could be other underlying deed restrictions that, um, you know, the city doesn't have much of an ability to control. So that would you know, continue to preclude the development of these middle housing types. So, um, you know, it's, there's certainly certain areas where we know that they're covered by HOAs, et cetera. Um, but unfortunately there, there's a lot of sort of very fine comb fine combing um, of, of a lot of details to look through there. And um, that's just beyond the scope of what we're able to do by the deadline. Um, so yeah, I hope that addresses both Lisa and uh, Samuel's question there. What do, you, is there any kind of survey data? Do you have an estimate of how many lots that that covers in the city beyond where, where besides where they are? <clears throat> um, just just an estimate of, of how much that covers. Uh, you know, we we don't, you know, it's oftentimes the case that even property owners don't have a great understanding of, of the restrictions on their property and the deed. Um, so, you know, it, it is, these are private agreements between private entities and the city is just not a party um, to those agreements that we don't have the ability to sort of preclude uh, middle housing, um, you know, exclusions. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, something that we can certainly you know, talk more about, but, you know, that is a very widely re renowned and widely recognized limitation of, of the legislation of the state. Um, I, uh, I think Larry Steiner, do you probably were next in line here? Um, do you have a question still? No, I got it answered. Thank you. Great. All right. So let's move on to Carol. Um, yeah, regarding uh, Senate Bill 458, um, Lake Oswego currently has a fairly robust participatory um, neighborhood association involvement in uh, land divisions and lot splits. And it seems like 458 speaks to um, how it may impact that. I'm wondering if you can say just a little bit about your read on that kind of participation process and its impact by 458. Um, I can address that if, if you'd like, but you know, my 
the general understanding is that it would be an expedited process um, that would be subject to clear and objective standards. Um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not sure if discretionary, um, you know, if, if an applicant does choose to go this track for the expedited uh, subdivision or land division process, I'm not sure that we can apply the same sort of discretionary approval criteria that we do to um, subdivisions or partitions today. I'm, I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily completely accurate. So um, again, we have a lot of information that we need to hear from the state in terms of how this will impact the city. So, um, but that's broadly my understanding is that it is intended to expedite um, those subdivisions and that it would be more of a clear and objective path. In those clear and objective uh, pathways, we still have uh, pre-application and notification. And so that was the piece in 458 that um, I had some uh, question about and perhaps as we go forward, if you have any clarity you can bring to us, that would be really appreciated, thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very good question. And I think um, there's still some sort of a lot of answers that we need to talk about with the city attorney's office, et cetera, about the implications of the legislation. But, um, you know, generally speaking, um, that's something that we're, you know, definitely going to be talking about is what that process will look like. Um, and I'm not sure that there's anything that would preclude the city from sending out notifications or anything of that nature. So, um, you know, in terms of the notification element of the procedure, I don't think there would be any need to change it based on my understanding. Thanks. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Jamin, um, just from a broad perspective, but no, I don't. to be determined, unfortunately, this is a, a big sort of uh, new element of, uh, of, our, of our work here. Um, I'll move on to Todd for the next question. I just wanted to jump in on the deed restriction question. Um, just one example of that, my understanding is that um, properties with lake access privileges, which covers about a third of the city, um, would lose their lake access privileges if they were to add these types of middle housing units. So that's not a direct prohibition on this type of housing, but it would create a major barrier. Um, so that gives you a sense of scale on, on the types of things that are out there um, working against these types of regulations. And I think it would be kind of interesting to have that type of analysis, um, not only that specific example, but I live in the Forest Highlands neighborhood and I know that, um, or at least my understanding is that developers really look to larger lots and, and larger homes, um, less density, for development, that's just what the market supports. Um, and there's all kinds of uh, strategies used to decrease density um, to build single family homes. And, and I think it would be interesting to see like a market analysis of, of how much of these types of units are really um, uh, likely in Lake Oswego. And then if we understood that better, maybe we could see where these areas could be tailored best and be most effective. So we're not kind of blanketing the entire city, but maybe targeting to, to where these units would really be utilized. I think that's a, a great point. And um, uh, something I've thought, thought about a lot is, is trying to predict where middle housing is most likely to happen. Uh, and I, I think we could continue to try to focus on that. Um, one of the words of caution there is that um, in um, most of those areas where um, the predominant uh, housing that's been built is single family, uh, the zoning never did allow anything else for the most part. So there, it's hard to say whether as the zoning allows it, whether there'll be a shift towards it or how, how that'll shake out, whether the market will just continue to focus more on single family detached. Um, there's, there's definitely trends towards smaller household sizes overall, which would, which would speak to more smaller units. Um, the overall cost of development makes it, it's getting it to the point where there's a lot of um, benefit to more units on one side and density. So, um, 
I think you could make the case either way that there'll be a major shift or there'll be no shift at all. <laughs> and it, there's, it's hard to tell. Yeah. And then just to follow on Lisa's question, just asked whether we're allowed to target areas or if that's prohibited by the rules. But I thought I had read in the background materials that you could do an analysis and target areas. So could you answer that? Yeah, I could. Yeah. I can handle that one. Um, so yeah, you, that's kind of what Jamin was talking about with the decisions that were made um, from uh, our phase one work to pursue the minimum compliance as opposed to the performance metrics track. Um, again, that's kind of based on the difficulty of coming up with you know a criteria that we could actually use and land at these different percentages for you know seventy percent for quadplexes or sixty percent um, for, um, you know, other, other housing types. I forget the exact percentages off the top of my head, but, um, we did sort of analyze that and, and look at different ways that maybe, you know, we could focus density here. And would that make sense in terms of our previous comprehensive planning in terms of centers and corridors? And we did that analysis and determined that we would still not be compliant with the performance metric criteria if we were to do so. And so there was a concern, that you know, this could sort of become a us versus them, winners and losers kind of uh, juggling um, of of, uh, of the ball here when it comes to middle housing, and that it would be, um, you know, I think just more consistent with the overall goal to implement it more broadly. So there there is a flexibility to target to a degree, but the way that the state set up the performance metric rules are such that it is incredibly difficult to meet the threshold. Um, so. I guess Stephanie, if if uh, if you have a question, if nobody else has any other follow up questions, at least on that, you can go ahead. Okay, Larry. Thanks. So, oh, sorry. Right. So Larry, did you have a question related to that? That previous yeah, I did. Uh, um, so the only thing that's obligatory about this legislation is that the cities must adopt this as a part of their of, of their planning ordinance. Uh, other than that, uh, it's, it's voluntary. It's voluntary on developers and it's voluntary on property owners, correct? So the only obligatory thing is to incorporate this into our planning documents. Uh, to exactly. allow That's it a, pursuant to yeah. zoning, yeah. Okay. yeah. It's a very important thing. And, and if you all can help us to communicate that message to the, the public, because sometimes it is confusing of like, I oh, know. Does this mean I that know. we have to? We have developers those aren't allowed to build houses. Zoning. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 it is a the requirements apply to the city's zoning, not to a property owner, not to a developer, it's to the zoning. Right. All right. So Stephanie, sorry to, um, to interrupt you there, but um, please. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Um, I to the point of the. Um, thresholds, the performance metric thresholds of 80%, 70%, 60%, and so on. Um, I'm curious, uh, just to make sure I was understanding that the CCNRs that, uh, you know, within these neighborhoods that have the HOAs, if they're exempted from allowing middle housing, does that mean that the rest that does, do we just make a smaller pie of needing to comply, like they're fully exempted? Or does it mean like, that 20% is the 20% that doesn't comply and the whole rest of the city must comply. D so that, that, whole, that, that whole analysis and, um, you know, the city was to submit an application to, to the state to say, we comply because we need these thresholds. Uh, that would be completely disregarding any CCNRs that are in effect. So it's only about the, the residential zoning districts and those the requirements on the city's development code. So, uh, okay. it's, it, yeah, and all of those properties that have CCNRs, they also are have a residential zone district. The CCNR is kind of layered on top of that. So it's just that whole layer is not subject to House Bill 2001. It's an existing CCNR, and so we, we can't consider it. I see. So if, the, so for example, if I, I'm just using the example that came up earlier, I, I don't actually know the details here, but if Mountain Park is exempted because of CCNRs, they would still be part of the, you know, whatever, 80% allowable. It would just then be an effective lower number that could actually be accomplished because those CCNRs would essentially block 
that. Okay, thank you. I understand that now. And I do have one more um, question. Just um, one, I, one well, I just wanna clarify something really quickly when it oh, comes mm -hmm. to CCNRs. I'm sorry to interrupt you again. Um, but you know, it's also important to think um, about the future and that these are private agreements that could be changed in the future. So it's important to plan for the possibility that these private agreements will no longer be in place. Of course, there is sort of a, an issue where we might be creating this sort of false housing stock to a degree where we're saying no housing might be permitted through our city processes, but there might be underlying restrictions that could prevent it to a certain degree. Um, but you know, there, there is a responsibility the city has to sort of plan for that potentiality that it is um, you know, in some way opened up to middle housing in the future. Okay, thank, thank you for that clarification. And my other question was around, and, I, I, and maybe this is all gonna be part of the forthcoming information around SB uh, 458, um, but I'm just curious with allowing the partitioning of lots below a single lot size. So like if the zoning is 5,000 square feet and you're allowed to divide that into four lots or whatever the actual number would be, then can you divide those again? Like at what point <laughs> Do we stop having like postage stamp lots? Um, I just, I don't think I understand how that would work and how the zoning would actually mean anything anymore. No, I was just actually looking at the bill and I think that the the city can prohibit further redivision after they, after a, a lot is divided under Senate Bill 458. Um, so I think there is some protection against against that. Yeah, but you know, I think just in general, these are details that we'll really start talking about, um, you know, later in the process when we talk about the scale and form um, and uh, different middle housing types and the approach that we want to take. Um, so these are really good questions, um, and I think, you know, there's a, you know, I think it's important to, I guess, point out also though that this land division um, sort of process it it wouldn't necessarily be, you know, I think a lot of it's oriented um, towards that sort of fee simple ownership. So um, townhouses where they are their own sort of individual lots within a larger complex development, um, you know, to allow for divisions that would just permit that to go forward because those are um, necessary for that type of townhouse development. That's sort of the definition of a townhouse is that it's its own sort of isolated unit. Um, so anyway, there's a lot of specifics to get into there and um, certainly relevant questions. So um, I don't necessarily want to um, end this conversation, but I do just want to do a time check. Um, we are running a bit late here. So, um, you know, I want to make sure that all the questions are addressed and um, I would encourage folks if there are remaining questions to reach out to me um, either individually or, um, you know, once we have the information for the contacts all spread out, we can, uh, you know, reach out to the larger group and, and talk this through a little bit further so that we can have that, the answers sort of distributed amongst uh, all of us. Um, so that, you know, will be something that we can follow up with you on. Um, so, you know, I think it's really helpful, you know, just hearing this conversation, I realize that it's probably um, a bit late to talk about the sort of charge of, of the advisory committee and why we're here and sort of the direction that we've been given from council. I think this might put a lot of this into context. Um, so, you know, I just want to jump a little bit further um, into, uh, you know, kind of the work plan that we have and also just really talk about what we're, what we're here for, what council and the planning commission expect us to accomplish. Um, so, um, if anybody does have any sort of really pertinent questions that they want to wrap up really quickly, I'm happy to do so, but otherwise I can move forward if, if that sounds good to the rest of the group. All right, Cynthia. Yeah, it looks like you're muted. Yeah, I know, no, sorry. Um, I'm not gonna bring the questions up now, but I hope being from the, a representative from the 50 plus committee, um, that we we always frame this as how many it as an opportunity for aging in place issues as well as accessibility issues and multi-generational household issues so this some of these discussions that's where i had some questions that would lead but uh, to the consultant or staff just to please you know as we talk about these to sometimes um i think there are a lot of opportunities here and sometimes um eric knows how I, <laughs> he's talking but as a 50 plus represent those are really important issues that that I hope we look at this as an opportunity to apply to all neighborhoods in Lake Oswego. So thank you. Thank you, Cynthia, I appreciate yeah. it. Um, and so, you know, I think that's a, a good segue, I guess, to talk about, um, you know, some of the uh, specific charge that we got from council. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share 
the resolution that um, created the committee um, that we're here today. Uh, one second. Too many windows. All right. So can everybody sort of uh, see that enough to, to read it? I guess I can always try to zoom in if, if you'd like. All right. Um, so, you know, I think just really as a, as a very basic sort of, um, you know, element of this middle housing committee, we really wanted to talk about where, you know, why, why we're here, you know, where, where this came from and what we've been directed to do by the city council. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is definitely something that's been on the uh, radar of city council and the planning commission for a few years. It's been an ongoing um, goal for city council to um, adopt, you know, codes that will comply with House Bill 2001. And um, that's part of their larger um, council goal to conserve the community's quality of life uh, by planning for change and growth. Um, so, you know, they did adopt an, an initiative. The city council adopted an initiative earlier this year um, to, uh, you know, essentially adopt codes that comply with House Bill 2001 that are consistent with the community's sense of place, neighborhood character, and livability. And so that's kind of what we're here for, you know, just to talk a little bit more about the recommendations that had been developed through phase one of that process and um, recommendations that we would, uh, or I guess refinements to those recommendations rather that we could offer that could help sort of further those uh, goals from, from the city council and um, in the planning commission. Um, so, you know, essentially the uh, ad hoc middle housing code advisory committee as we called it, and I'm not a huge fan of acronyms. So I'm just going to call it the, the middle, middle housing committee uh, for, for short, <laughs> um, but uh, essentially the, or the committee, I guess. Um, but, you know, the committee uh, is really intended to help the city council and the planning commission develop a response to the bill um, that is able to comply with the legislation, the deadline that um, city adopt compliant code by June 30th, 2022. So I can talk a little bit more about this, but I'm going to actually start um, to share the, um, the charge document and um, some other uh, work plan information. Um, so just one moment, I'm going to stop sharing this and bring up a little bit more specifics as to uh, the issues and sort of general work plan that we were hoping to uh, address with the committee's work. and. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, we don't um, have uh, too many meetings scheduled, so we have no more than five meetings that we've uh, discussed will be on the sort of um, agenda or the sort of larger schedule for the committee. So we have to make sure that we're using those uh, fairly efficiently and effectively. So we just wanted to establish a work plan that would allow us to do so. Um, so this is the document that we had come up with to sort of just identify some of the issues that we would be talking about um through the process of um, our meetings this summer um, this input and sort of the development of this document came from <laughs> recommendations we received them from the planning commission as well as city council in terms of the issues that they felt should be further explored by the committee and recommendations that they wanted us to look into further so one of those key issues um, is um, something that should be of interest obviously to uh, folks with a historical um, or sort of historic resources background. Um, preservation of existing residential structures is something that uh, was of uh, concern to the planning commission in particular. Um, so you know, really we're gonna be exploring questions of should the city you know, think about incentives and ways that we could you know, encourage um, the creation of middle housing in ways that could still preserve and retain existing buildings and um, preserve some of the neighborhood character um, even if it's not, you know, potentially qualified as a historic resource. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of different uh, things that we can do that could uh, have an impact there, um, but different um, recommendations that we'll be discussing as part of that conversation would be, you know, what is a demolition specifically? Um, and, you know, is there some, is there a need for the city to revise the definition of demolition? Um, is there, um, you know, is there a variance that might be, uh, you know, uh, allowed for certain sort of uh, middle housing infill development that would retain an existing structure. So these are issues that we'll be talking about um, in, in our next meeting, actually. Um, we'll be providing some uh, materials in advance of that to frame the discussion, and we'll be getting a little bit more into those specific uh, questions. 
And just I'm going to jump to number three because that will also be the topic of um, the first meeting or the, the first sort of substantive non housekeeping meeting, I guess, our next meeting. Um, we're also looking at um, recommendations surrounding landscaping and stormwater um, and the potential impacts that increased density could have to um, stormwater infrastructure in particular. So, you know, that's something that we will again get into a lot more detail with, but. Um, you know, we're looking into sort of a question as to whether, in addition to lot coverage, it would make sense for the city to consider impervious surfaces as they do in certain um, overlay zones within the city um, when we consider uh, new housing development of all types, both single family and middle housing. Um, so again, this is something that would apply to, um, you know, the underlying zoning, the underlying zoning would need to allow for both single family and middle housing generally. Um, so this would be a recommendation that would impact both of those housing types. Um, but we can talk more again about this um, once we provide you know, more information, obviously, um, we can talk through these questions at a, a future meeting, but that would be sort of a general issue and uh, topic we would hope to address based on the guidance that we got from the Planning Commission. Um, kind of the biggest, I guess, more meaty uh, topic that we'll really be uh, wanting to to delve into, we proposed actually two meetings to, to discuss scale and character of new middle housing. Um, so recommendations that could, um, you know, address concerns about um, the potential impact of middle housing when it comes to driveways and garages and what that looks like from the street, um, the sort of building size or mass, lot coverage, um, things that um, might sort of you know, when it comes to middle housing, there might be a more of a tendency to maximize, um, you know, existing zoning standards. So, you know, are there any adjustments necessary um, to those underlying standards that might be necessary considering that um, that is a potential. Um, so, you know, really we want to talk about this when it comes to all of the different middle housing types. So plexes, in addition to cottage clusters and townhomes, you know, what can we do um, in terms of our regulations that could be a little bit different, still compliant with um, code, but still be able to, um, you know, manage things in a way that would uh, respond to the concerns that we heard um, overwhelmingly in the uh, neighborhood character reports and the outreach that we did earlier this year. And certainly not least, but lastly, um, is sort of issues of affordability and accessibility with middle housing development. And so, we'd mentioned this uh, a bit maybe in our presentation, but um, while there is sort of an underlying intent for House Bill 2001 to create a wider variety of housing options and that that can lend itself to uh, more affordability and access to people at different income levels, um, there's really, in Lake Oswego, we might not necessarily see, um, you know, quote unquote, affordable or even relative uh, sort of affordability in these types of units if they're um, you know, sort of following existing trends. So, um, you know, is there something that the city could do to make sure that this is sort of a subsidized or sort of to encourage um, subsidized uh, versions of middle housing to ensure that they are affordable? And as well, you know, is there something that um, the city could do to encourage that new middle housing or conversions to middle housing are um, ADA accessible um, beyond what would be required pursuant to the building code? Is there ways that we can, you know, provide incentives to encourage more of that? Um, and, you know, how should we really address that in terms of our recommendations? Um, so those are the general sort of broad outline topics that we um, have decided to delve more into based on the structure of the Middle Housing Opportunities Report that was developed by Jamin for the first phase. Um, so you can see a little bit of information that's in the Middle Housing Opportunities Report currently on these topics, but again, we will be um, sending out uh, packets prior to each meeting with um, much more information so that we can delve further into these discussions. And uh, just to sort of summarize what the schedule would be, obviously today we have, um, uh, again, more housekeeping tasks. We're hoping to <laughs> hopefully quickly elect a vice chair and a chair. We're running a bit out of time here, um, as well as bylaws today. And then the idea would be to delve into the specific um, topics in future meetings. So um, again, sort of preservation um, and landscaping stormwater concerns will be the topic of our first meeting. Um, or I'm sorry, the, our first sort of substantive meeting <laughs> on August 10th. Um, the uh, sort of scale and character concerns will be spread across two meetings as I mentioned earlier on the 24th of August and 
the 15th of September. And um, we're recommending that we add an additional meeting. Um, that's kind of how we had established this in uh, the resolution at city council is no more than five meetings and considering the sort of scope and um, uh, just the sort of breadth of what we need to address with this effort, we think that a fifth meeting will be advisable. So um, that's something that I have on the agenda for us to address, but considering where we're at, um, I would prefer to just send, send out a doodle poll with some times and um, we'll come up with a date that works best for everybody for that fifth meeting um, in an offline uh, capacity. Uh, so with that, I will um, stop talking and allow folks to uh, ask me any questions in terms of the sort of charge uh, that we got from council um, to you know address these particular issues in the planning commission as well um, or um, the schedule that's been outlined for the topics that we'll cover um, so if anybody has any questions please please go ahead and raise your hands all right well it sounds like um, there are no questions which means that we can move forward um, so you know I think Again, we're, we're running a bit out of time here, so I apologize, but I will go ahead and move back to the agenda. The next uh, issue that we're hoping to cover today is the election of a committee chair and vice chair. <clears throat> the, that's something that you know I would like to facilitate, but ultimately it's going to be left up to the committee to make that determination. So I suppose what I would do first is open up um, Nomination. So if anybody has any ideas for folks that they would like to nominate to be a chair or a vice chair, um, please let us know. Carol. Uh, yes, um, I would like to nominate Randy Arthur as a, a chair for this committee. He's um, served as the chair of the Planning Commission and also on the uh, Development Review Commission. He's participated for a number of years. So I think he's got a good track record and uh, background in doing that. So I'd like to put his name forward. I second. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> um, so are there any objections or is there any discussion that folks want to have on this? Well, I would be pleased to serve as chair and I think we have a really good group. I've worked with many of you on the group and some of you I'm just meeting for the first time but I think we have a really good uh, collegial respectful rapport and I, I would be happy to serve as chair if that was the committee's desire. Thank you. Well, we're in a sort of strange position where we don't have bylaws to establish a process for this all I think at this point, but um, I think- uh, I move uh, we close the nominations. <laughs> <laughs> we can go with some Robert's Rules border for the time being. Um, so yeah, I think um, it sounds like, again, uh, if there are no objections or no further sort of discussion, um, we have a, a chair. So Larry Snyder, if, or I'm sorry, Randy Arthur, if you accept, um, you will be our, the chair of the Middle Housing Code Advisory Committee. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the honor and I'll do my best. Glad you're doing it. Great. Um, and I guess, you know, the, the vice chair is another thing that we should talk about. Um, I'm not sure if there are any nominations or folks that want to volunteer themselves for a vice chair role, but um, if so, please let us know. Who wants to? Um, this is Lisa. I'll be the vice chair if there's no one nominated or interested. Um, I'll second that. that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. All right. So if there are no objections or further discussion, um, we can go ahead and um, accept uh, Lisa Schrader as the vice chair of the Middle Housing Code Advisory Committee. Um, any other comments on that? All right. Well, it's a uh, it's a uh, helpful to see that we're <laughs> trying to move forward at least quickly on this. So um, I uh, appreciate that. So. Thank you so much, um, Randy and Lisa, for your volunteering or accepting of uh, the nomination in some cases. Um, but I think it'll be Thank great you. to to have folks. You know, I, I think everybody here is obviously very, very qualified. But um, I can certainly uh, see that we're in good hands with the two of you. So appreciate it. Um, moving forward, um, uh, we will discuss the bylaws, and I will attempt to do so quickly because I've um, at least scheduled uh, this meeting to go until seven thirty, and I very much apologize. 
that we're running a bit late here. So we'll be more mindful and try to schedule things a little bit more quickly and uh, more uh, with a little bit more uh, forethought in future, just to make sure we have enough time for these conversations, because there will be a lot of questions, I'm sure. Um, so I'll go ahead and share my screen with the bylaws and we can just go over those and um, potentially adopt them if folks are comfortable. So we did send out, or I did send out, um, hopefully this draft got to everybody. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure if we want to go through the entire document, you know, we don't have too much time. So I'll try to uh, at least make an assumption that most of you have had the chance to review the document. Um, you know, one thing that I might just want to uh, ask though, is that, you know, if there are any questions or concerns or comments that folks had on the document, um, the sort of draft bylaws, and um, obviously the charge was sort of a resolution from city council. So um, we don't have much sort of ability to change that. Um, but uh, uh, Carol, what was your question on that? Uh, just a quick question. Could you say something about the, the emails and the government document piece? And um, I'd like to have a good understanding of our communication and, and how we should handle that. So in terms of, will they be public um, record? Is that sort of the, the question that you're referring yeah. to? Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, essentially they, you know, any communication with city staff is public record. So um, this would be, um, all communications would be available um, if uh, there was a request to receive them. In terms of what will be immediately made to, available to the public, we will be um, posting uh, you know, all the meetings, in addition to allowing folks to come and witness them, we will be posting the video recording of them online. Um, so that's kind of the, the extent of what we have here. But if you have a suggestion um, or, you know, where we might be able to, um, you know, I guess if we do receive any email correspondence and have a response um, that uh, we'd like to make public, that we can include that in the materials for future meeting packets. And um, I'm not sure if that's something that you were sort of getting at, but um, we can certainly try to ensure that those communications are um, included in sort of the log in, in the meeting materials moving forward. Thanks. I just appreciate your um, actually just clarifying with the, the Zoom uh, recording and the things that are available for people to follow with. Thanks. Great. Go yeah. ahead. Oh, please. Sorry. Excuse me. I, I had a follow up question. So for clarification, if members of the committee are emailing each other or one another about matters the committee's addressing, are those considered public record? Is there some care that should be taken to those or is there, are there multiple levels of communication? I tend to think maybe it's all communication, but I wanted to clarify that. I, you know, it's all something that could be uh, requested by the public if, if there was a, a request for that public record. You know, I think there's, um, a question of, you know, if we're, if we're discussing something that's um, certainly very pertinent and answers a question that folks might have um, that would be helpful, um, you know, we could make those public um, prior to the meeting or sort of in advance of the next meeting. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, the um, emails could be made public um, if uh, we did receive a request. So I might suggest if committee members are emailing each other, they might put in the subject line maybe just the initials M-H-C-A-C. That would be one way if you were ever asked for your emails relating to the committee, you might be able to quickly locate them. And then you might just have a separate folder. I don't know if people still do folders, I do, but maybe those are passe. But if you have a separate folder in your email, you could just put those there in case there was ever a request for it. That would be my thought. Yeah, I think that's a reasonable suggestion. You know, we have typical, you know, we have some processes to address this internally, but, um, you know, I, there's also the question of what would be helpful to provide as we go on through the process, I think. Um, Larry, did you have a question? Yeah, are we subject to uh, the kind of regulation that, that most city boards are, and that is that we could not have a meeting of what would amount to a quorum of this committee? because that would constitute a committee meeting? Uh, ex parte contact type of uh, issue, I guess, or yeah, I guess um, just outside of the official sort of meeting times, is that what you're right. referring to? Yeah. 
Um, you know, I, I'm not sure about that. I think it would, I think it would be similar to a board and commission where it, it would operate in that way, but I can ask for more clarification from the city attorney's office because I'm not sure I have a great answer to that question for you. Okay. Hey, yeah, Eric, this is Lisa having just rolled off the DEI task force. What I remember, but probably with not enough specificity is that, you know, if two or if, if Cynthia and Larry and I are emailing each other. The three of us are fine, but if it gets to that quorum level that Larry was mentioning, that becomes a public record. Um, it would be really helpful to know um, what our limitations are because I do think, especially once we get each other's contact information, that some of us do have those overlapping links and we might wanna connect on a smaller level and given COVID and everything, it might not be realistic mm -hmm. to go have coffee together or whatever. Um, so that's just my recollection is that we, we got to some threshold on the DEI task force where we were effectively having a meeting, but smaller conversations were acceptable, but it would be really great if the city attorney could give us some kind of specific, yeah, yeah. that would be so helpful. I will definitely follow up on that question for you. And sorry, I don't have more clarification right now. Um, you know, I, I think we do have one more question, Stephanie. Thank you, yes. Um, I just was curious about the requirement for um, a two thirds vote um, as opposed to the simple majority. Um, I'm, I, I don't know exactly how our votes will be, uh, what, what format that might take and what weight that might carry. So I don't, I'm asking a little bit of a question in the dark. Um, uh, but I'm I'm curious about why we would take a it, you know the way it's written it it sounds that we're taking a different approach from what's typical. Just curious about that. Yeah, you know, um, I think that it reads such that two thirds of the committee would need to be present in order to vote on on a particular topic. Not that two thirds of the committee would have, so to, have to. Oh, yeah. Thank you. I misread um, it. Thank you so much. Okay. And sort of that's, um, you know, that's kind of uh, also sort of, uh, you know, as a, you know, there's a process where we would encourage a consensus to be reached in, in any um, situations where that can be reached. And so the vote is kind of um, presented in the bylaws as if, if we can't reach a consensus, then we might want to consider doing the vote. And if we did the vote, this is, you know, the, the folks that would need to be present in order to do so. Um, so with that, oh, Cynthia, please. Yeah, my committee, um, I will, will be reporting back to the 50 plus, and I know some of them are inter were interested as a committee, but also as individuals, some of the people are. So how does the public, if they want to weigh in, is it the best, you know, in other words, my opinion is that, you know, people can have different opinions on different things, but I think, as you know, with our goals being um, consistent with some of this discussion, I just wanted to know what's the best way, is it or, to weigh in? If yeah. they have public input, yeah, or if you know, anyone asks me as a fifty plus member, someone in the public just asked me, what's the best way for me to weigh in? Yeah, so I would um, encourage them to just reach out to me. Um, I'll make okay. it more clear when I send out future meeting materials that not only can you contact me with questions or concerns or you know any any sort of uh, clarifications you might need, but also to make comments um, as we move forward on the process. So that will you know, obviously have all those in the log as we receive them, but. Um, you can send them to me or, you know, obviously the, you know, if you have a committee that you're conferring with and you want to be sort of the messenger for that committee, um, we would encourage you to sort of compile um, those questions and, and bring them to us and, um, you know, just if you have multiple questions, it might just be easier to address them all at once. Um, so yeah. Oh, please. Go ahead, Steve. Could you just review again what the opportunity is for the public to to view these meetings in real time or to participate? Is yeah. there like a citizen's comment period or something analogous to that, or is it just an opportunity to view and perhaps right. send anything else? Yeah, there's an opportunity to view the meetings as we had envisioned it in the bylaws that, that we drafted. Um, so there would be an opportunity to view the meeting as well as a recording the meeting that would be accessible prior, or I'm sorry, following the meeting. Um, and you know we want to receive, or at least our idea was to receive written public comment, or um, you know any uh, you know I guess anything that's funneled through a committee that might be um, given to a representative of a committee. 
Um, but generally that we would encourage written comment um, just to make sure that we have, you know, I think there's a lot of um, sort of things that we can address offline and provide in the meeting packet materials that might allow us to be a little bit more effective in terms of the limited time that we do have for these meetings. So um, that was the idea. Um, so if there are other suggestions, you know, we can certainly consider those. I think that's a good approach. Our time is very constrained and I find it helpful to read comments um, as, as effective as listening sometimes. Does Zoom have a provision where persons not on the committee could observe the live meeting but not participate? Yes, and we actually have two people doing so currently. Oh, okay. So we need, if, if we have people, Cynthia, wherever, wherever you are, uh, who want to see, we need to get communicate that information to them how they can do it. Yes, yeah. So that you know, we we did send out the um, the sort of meeting materials and information on how to participate and how to register to attend the meeting. Good. And we sent that out. We sent that to the neighborhood chairs as well as um, the uh, larger listserv of all the folks that signed up during the sort of uh, neighborhood. Um, character report and survey process that we had all those folks that did the, the survey that we were able to get um, signed up and engaged. So we're trying to distribute that to a large population when, when we do so. I don't know if it's possible for you to put it in the hello, hello, how that would be in terms of timing, but that might be an option as well. Yeah, we, we've been doing monthly updates in hello, hello. And so it's it, we're doing our best to sort of have that correspond with new information, but generally it will be uh, a little bit more general, I guess, when it's in the Hello with a link to the website with you know the most current information. So, um, but yeah, that's that's part of our social media strategy um, is to I, I'm not sure you consider Hello Hello social media, but it's sort of part of our communication strategy mm -hmm. um, is to in addition to social media use Hello Hello, and we have Madison Thiesing in um, uh, the sort of city manager's office helping us out with that. or we have so far at least. And so we, we intend to have her, um, you know, obviously continue to help us spread the word about the community's work. Right. So, you know, are the, I guess I'll ask the question, if there are any folks that were not able to read the, the bylaws um, or if there are any folks that had, you know, other concerns about things that you would propose for a change to, to the bylaws? I just uh, had one, Thing I wanted to emphasize under our ground rules for conduct of the committee, and it may fit in under D, I'm not sure, but I wanted to emphasize that our meeting is really a safe zone where people can respectfully and courteously express their opinions without fear of recrimination, retribution, ridicule, or embarrassment, or cancellation, or boycotts if they're a business person. So I would like to just emphasize that this is a safe zone for comments. I think that's something we had tried to do on the planning commission when I served on it. And I'd like to see us continue that here. Great, thank you so much, Randy. I appreciate you reinforcing that. Um, Todd, did you have a question? I think you're muted right now. Yeah, there's a provision in there that talks about missing two consecutive meetings. And um, I'm actually a consultant for the city of Milwaukee on a mental housing uh, code update. And they have two meetings scheduled consecutively that overlap with two of our meetings. Um, I may be able to make part of the meeting, maybe on one of them, but I just wanted to see how set in stone that rule is. I, I know that you had actually reached out to me about that before. So I agree that that's, um, you know, we certainly want to address that. So we could entertain a motion perhaps to remove that clause or to change it to three meetings, depending on what um, folks think would be appropriate. That might be a sort of direct way to address that concern. Or maybe to make them unexcused if they're unexcused absences, that it, to have the opportunity, if you know in advance, you have a reasonable basis or conflict, you could, have what would be an excused absence that wouldn't count to the a strike against you. That sounds like a great suggestion. Does that does that make sense, Todd? So if you let us know in advance, you're not going to be available, then it wouldn't apply. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm working to see if there's flexibility in the other meetings, but so far I haven't 
had that. I certainly understand that uh, just having scheduled these meetings so far, and I apologize for the repeated uh, correspondence and uh, communication related to scheduling these meetings. And I know it's a challenge, so I'm happy to accommodate. Um, Thank you. And uh, you know, I think just another sort of note on that, um, we do have um, a representative from the Planning Commission that um, still actually needs to be formally appointed by the City Council, I suppose, on the committee, but they weren't able to join us today. So that's another sort of um, committee member that won't um, be at all the meetings as well. So I guess you, know, you can consider that an excused absence as well. Um, so I think uh, if, if folks are comfortable with that, maybe we should entertain a motion to um, change that to sort of um, unexcused absences to unexcused absences in a row. Yes, I would move then to approve these proposed bylaws with the modification relating to unexcused absences as not counting against one and to add some comment about this being a safe zone. Second. Any discussion? I just have a thought. I don't know if it needs to be included in any way, but uh, perhaps there would be an expectation that if you can't attend the meeting, that you would watch uh, the meeting so that you're up to date on the, the conversations that were held. Watch the recording. That's, that's an excellent point. Mm -hmm. That's a good yeah. yeah. That's a great idea. Um, I believe it's suggesting a, something to add to the bylaws, or that's just an aspirational comment. Were you wanting to amend the bylaws to add that? I don't know that it's necessary. I, just, I think we can all just do our best to be informed. So just wanted to share that thought. No, I appreciate that. That's a good point. Any other discussion on the pending motion? Todd, did you have a comment? I, mean, I, I like the idea of reviewing the materials beforehand and reviewing the video afterwards to be as informed as you can if you are missing a meeting. Well, I would plan on doing that. Good point. Any other comments on the motion? If not, let's take a vote. All in favor of adopting the bylaws as amended and discussed. Say aye. 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 Any aye. opposed? Any abstaining? Good. Well, we've adopted the bylaws then. Thank you all very much. Yeah, thank you so much for, for uh, your cooperation today and your willingness to uh, get through the agenda that we have for you. Um, Really appreciate it. Um, and again, you know, the last uh, you know thing that we wanted to address today, I will just follow up with a doodle poll so that we can get that fifth meeting scheduled for later in October or later in September, rather. Um, so it should be that last week of September, and um, I will be reaching out with some follow up to the questions that emerged today, in addition to that doodle poll. And um, obviously, we'll be reaching out as well with materials for our next meeting, which is scheduled for August 10th at 5.30, um, 5 30 p.m. It's getting too late for me, apparently. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll continue to try to hold meetings at that time. Um, and otherwise, I, I think we should probably uh, just uh, go our separate ways today. So thank you so much again for attending and for all of your time and dedication to this topic. I really appreciate everything. And thanks for staying with us an extra 15 minutes as well. Thank you. Thank nice you. to meet you all. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Good night.